I want to start with NIL as uh, we are knocking on the door of the two-year anniversary. Darren, thank you. Uh, you played such a big role in, 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 in NIL and with, with a number of the athletes and schools. Uh, so much conversation about this. Where, where are we right now as we're knocking on the door of that two-year anniversary? Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me back. Where are we right now? We are at an inflection point where now there are many states, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, New York, and others that are considering legislation that would not only tell the NCAA that it can't tell the schools within the state what to do, can't penalize the schools, can't penalize the employees, the coaches, the athletic administrators, and the athletes, but also look at a bill like Missouri, which is sitting on the governor's desk, which goes as far as to say that those providing compensation can condition that payment on a student athlete's attendance at a university. So states are going above and beyond the NCA's rules and actually saying inducements may be allowed. Now, concurrently, you have a new NCA president and Charlie Baker and continued efforts to cause the federal government to do something on this subject. Realize, as you mentioned, we're about two years in, no movement on Capitol Hill yet we're hearing there's more legislation that's about to come out, including a bill from Liz, Leslie Graham, uh, where uh, or Lindsey Graham, I'm sorry, uh, which is called the College Sports NIL Clearinghouse Act of 2023, and essentially still trying to give an antitrust exemption so that the NCAA can finally enforce its rules, which it has not yet done in two years. So again, we're at an inflection point right now where states are really starting to push the envelope even more, basically telling the NCAA, your hands are completely tied. Darren, uh, I don't want to turn, turn you into a political pundit, but you know, as we're knocking on the door of a presidential election year with the entire Congress at stake, uh, do you think anything will happen uh, in, the, in the interim? Because if, if not, then we're back to square one, are we not? I believe so. I, I mean, I, I'm not a betting man, but if I were to place a wager on this, I would tell I would put my money on on the uh, federal uh, Congress doing nothing. There's been over 10 pieces of legislation over the past three years, going back prior to July 1, 2021, that have been proposed. Not a single one has actually reached the House floor or Senate floor for debate. Meanwhile, we've had, I think, eight different congressional committee hearings on NIL and yet nothing has been done here. So even though there's yet another piece of legislation that's about to be proposed, as you mentioned, there are much more pressing issues on a national basis, on an international basis. And I do not foresee this piece of legislation that I just referenced or any other ones actually making it to the desk of President Biden for his signature. So finally, back to the Charlie Baker piece. Yeah, it's an improvement. Uh, he's collegial. He knows a lot of people. He's a two-term governor, uh, but other than a lot of happy talk, which I hear from people that we speak to uh, about the current situation, is he going to matter uh, short-term or, or intermediate or long-term, for that matter? If we're talking about the potential for getting legislation actually passed through the House and the Senate, I don't believe so. And I've spoken to a few sources that I have on Capitol Hill who are very close to the situation on NIL. And what I keep hearing is that Charlie Baker and others at the NCA are begging action by Congress because even though the rhetoric has been, we're going to finally enforce our NIL rules, they are saying behind closed doors, we fear more litigation and more litigation that we're going to lose unless Congress intervenes and passes a piece of legislation that includes that antitrust exemption, but there's just not enough individuals on Capitol Hill who are interested in, I guess, setting their respective positions aside. And oh, by the way, the NCA has also pissed off a lot of colleges state by state, and these politicians are elected by those constituents in those states, and oftentimes are not willing to go above and beyond to assist the NCAA. So before we change subjects, uh, Darren, I, I know you said you're not a betting man, uh, but if you could uh, at least give us a roadmap of these next few years, what are, what are what is it going to look like? Well, I think, again, we're very close to seeing 
legislation in states like Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, et cetera, that essentially say or render the NCAA completely powerless on the issue of NIL. So what I think we're going to have, I mean, look, let's all be honest. We've had a lot of inducements where athletes, whether they're in high school or in the transfer portal, are being offered money in order to go to a specific university. But according to the NCAA right now, that is not permissible. With states actually codifying the fact that the NCAA can't do anything about it, and in fact, promoting inducements, that's where we're going. And again, I think what we're seeing is very quickly, maybe not over two years, but over a year or less, the NCAA is going to be rendered completely powerless on this issue. We will see more and more inducements and maybe even pay for play. On the NLRB card, uh, the, the that that's happening right now. How is that going to affect the sport and what does it mean to the future? You know, I think long term it has real potential to affect college sports as a whole and perhaps bleed into NIL and affect the way that we're seeing boosters and collectives spend money on athletes. But we're a ways away from it. Uh, just yesterday, there was a complaint that was filed against USC, the Pac-12 and the NCAA based on the allegation that the conference, the association, and the school have improperly labeled these athletes as not being employees. Now, the respondents, the USC, the Pac-12, the NCAA, have until June 1 to file an answer, and there won't be a hearing until November 7. But then the decision by that administrative judge can be appealed to the National Labor Relations Board, and then even that decision on appeal can once again be appealed to the federal courts. And so... I think we're still far away from any concrete decision as to whether or not athletes are labeled employees. And if that happens at that point in time, obviously we're talking about real wages, salary, um, conditions of employment, and maybe uh, minimizing the importance of NIL because really right now, again, if we're all gonna be honest, NIL is sort of taking the place in a lot of situations, what would be a salary otherwise. Certainly uh, Florida State's uh, Michael Alford was kind of um, insinuating a lot of things. There was this idea that said magnificent seven schools could potentially, uh, you get enough schools willing to, to leave the ACC, could you then that, that break the grant of rights? I mean, we were, if you, if you listen to the speculation and, and um, the experts on social media, we were close to, I mean, literally Armageddon in college athletics because if the ACC, the third biggest conference breaks up, um, I don't know where this ends up, but uh, apparently, we were not that close to all of that going down. Uh, they seem to be all on the same page, at least publicly, which what's that worth? I don't know, but it's better than not being on the same page publicly. And they seem to have agreed to some kind of uh, or to at least uh, pursue some kind of agreement where the uh, which I think they're calling the success in- initiative that the teams that do well, i.e. make the college football playoff, perhaps even. The, the men's basketball tournament will profit more from that, if not exclusively from that, in an effort to appease the schools that are, are doing better uh, rather than just share the revenue through all 15. So um, that's a fairly elo- elegant solution to at least uh, trying to bridge the gap between the SEC and the Big Ten, which have, you know, 30 million more a year coming out in, in, in revenue uh, and the ACC schools. So. I understand the reality that, that, that they have less money and they have less revenue, but I once heard it from a Big 12 AD uh, who basically said, we're always going to have less revenue. We just got to deal with it. Uh, to me, the, the ACC, you know, is spending, is, 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 is the only way to win, in, in, especially in football and basketball, uh, how much you spend? Is that it? Or do you have other resources? I, I certainly understand that North Carolina – can't spend as much as say Iowa, right? But there's a lot of advantages to being North Carolina that Iowa can't buy, or Ole Miss can't buy being, uh, you know, Clemson or, or Florida State. There, it's not solely about money. And so when you're talking about money and you're talking about how you can't compete and you're talking about how you don't have as much as these other guys, uh, I certainly understand the complaint. But you're you're kind of focusing on a negative about yourself instead of saying, hey. We're going to have enough money. We, we have enough money to compete here. We want to get closer and all those things. But focus on what makes the ACC unique. 
Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.